Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the Saturday's massive uh, UFC card, which is taking place in London. You will first notice that, um, or note, that it is a 1 p.m. start time, uh, which is uh, which is excellent <laughs> for, for those of us that don't like to stay up till 3 in the morning. Um, and if they actually do put 15 car fights out there, it's going to be amazing. Uh, it also makes for a very, very difficult DFS card. And it, what it also means is that you're going to have to be very, very greedy with respect to what types of plays you make. It's not going to be good enough to get six of six. Um, you're, you're going to need to, to find the upside. You're going to need to not settle for the underdog that, that squeaks out a decision. The way 15 fights works, right, uh, with respect to the math, is it just becomes that much more likely that there are big scores littered throughout the card. So you're going to have to... If you play GPPs, you're going to have to try to participate in that. So you're going to really need to, to, to go for those high scores. The other thing is that on a 15 fight card, I mean, it's likely that uh, the ownership is, is spread out a little bit um, just because it's 15 fights. So if you do like something, uh, chances are it's not going to be that highly owned. And yet on the other hand, if, if the wait, listen, the way the industry works is people start to just kind of gather onto a fight. And if somebody does become very, very popular on a 15 fight card, especially on a card like this, it's probably a, a reasonable fade. One second. Hello. Sorry about that. So, um, so if somebody does become really, really high owned, it's probably a reasonable fade. Um, because it's not like last week where you had, it will remember, in my opinion, there were two complete stone cold locks on the card. Um, the, the Carlston Harris and the Marab. They both won. Uh, Marab obviously made the, the optimal. And he, I think he scored the highest score in the history of, of MMA, DFS maybe. Um, and, and Harris, although, I mean, he didn't make the optimal, but only kind of by accident. 112 points out of 8,300. And that's really supposed to be enough. Anyway, uh, this week, we don't have that, I don't believe. Uh, we don't have these the, the Stone Cold Lock or the Stone Cold Even Lock height to target. There's just basically options, you know, throughout the entire card. Um, so anybody that shows up like really, really high owned, I think is going to be a reasonable thing. So I do I do encourage you to, to look at updated ownerships that I'll put out over the next uh, day or two. We, really leading right up until the beginning of the, you know, the fight card. I mean, I would, I would wait until really till Saturday morning to put anything in because you do want to get the, the updated ownership projections on, uh, on a card like this. Um, so let's just kind of go through it kind of fight by fight and, and kind of assess which, which fights look like <laughs> the ones we're going to want to play um, to, based on the various metrics we'd like to look at. So first of all, right off the bat, we have Juliana Miller against um, against uh, Veronica Hardy, and right off the bat, you have a, a minus five. Uh, well, I would say minus four hundred favorite um, in in Juliana Miller, and she's being priced like it at ninety four hundred. So there's no line value or anything like that. So remember what we need for a ninety four hundred dollar fighter to be you know to be competing. Uh, listen, we're talking about in a vacuum, right? We're not talking about in the context of the whole slate necessarily, but for a ninety-four hundred dollar fighter to get there, so to speak, she's got to or he's got to either, actually, not either, probably both, have significant first round um, upside. In addition to that, have some takedown upside. You know, ninety-four hundred that that's really asking for a lot, especially on a fifteen fight card. You know. Um, so when you look at her inside the distance prop, first of all, it's really, I mean, it's fine. Um, what do we have here? Miller inside the distance is uh, minus 130. You know, uh, actually with the VIG, it's probably probably about Pickham. I mean, that's not bad. As a matter of fact, let's pull up the DraftKings um, uh, sports book as well to give an idea of, of where they're coming in with some of these. I'm looking at this. So, so Juliana Miller round one is plus 225. That's an interesting thing to think about, you know, because if she does get there in round one, that's what you need, right? And if she does get there round one, it's like 100 plus maybe. Um, and that's going to happen about, it looks like, mm, well, if they're giving you plus 225, 
that means it probably actually is going to happen about what 25 percent of the time right because there's there's also you know there's there's big involved um so 25 percent of the time it's round one but the thing about juliana miller is that she definitely has some takedown up um and and when you when you and that's sort of hard to quantify you know except for when you run these, these high level projection models which we do have access to um, but it's hard to pre predict exactly how many takedowns she's going to get. And the question is, is how many do you want her to get? I mean, if, if you get, if you want her to go out to get there in the first round, you're probably going to get one takedown and a sub, right? It's, it's not likely that she gets two takedowns and a sub. So it's probably one takedown and a sub. And if you really want to get there with her, it's going to be one takedown and ground and pound, because then you get like all the significant strikes also. And it's got to be in the first round. Now, for her to get there in the second round, she's going to probably have to get one, maybe two takedowns in the first round, not get there, you know, not finish. The second round, get a second takedown, and then kind of ride her out and finish her late. So both of those things do have possibilities. Um, but in a 15-fight card, I, I just have a feeling that it's it's risking too much salary to 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 make that work. You know, the, the one thing I will say though about about this play is that I do suspect that it's going to be low owned. Um, nobody likes to play women's fighters. Nobody likes to play expensive women's fighters. Expensive women's fighters over the last two weeks have basically burned, you know, just basically burned money as as they usually do. Um, so you will you are getting probably a low ownership. Uh, situation with Juliana Miller. Um, so if you're playing 150, yeah, I think you should get some of that, but I certainly wouldn't imagine her being a priority um, on the slate. Uh, now, as far as Hardy goes, for, for a, a four plus 450 fighter to get my money, it's going to be very, very rare. Okay. Only when there's, you know, really extreme circumstances where, where, Number one, her, her opponent would probably have to be high owned, right? Because in addition to getting the plus 450, you know, you're only going to win the fight about 15, 20% of the time, maybe even 15% of the time. You want to get leverage on the fighter that you're fading. So, so uh, that's really the only time I'll play the $6,800 fighters. And, or the other, the other possibilities, if that fighter had just no other path to victory except for a huge score, now, I guess you could say that Hardy's path to victory is by submission. So if if Miller does get the takedown and 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 Hardy gets a kind of a miracle submission, I guess that's definitely possible. Um, and if she can do that and get the hundred points at sixty eight hundred, um, and she's going to be really low owned, yeah. I mean now now we're on to something. But I think overall this fight is I'm gonna I don't want to say under because. I was about to say I'm going to come under, go under the field on this fight, but I don't think that anybody's going to be playing this fight. So, so I'll probably end up being with the field, um, meaning very, very little exposure. And I will say that in in twenty max or less, I probably wouldn't play this fight at all. Right. Um, I see we're already headed for a pretty long breakdown today, but it's going to be what it is. Jai Herbert against uh, Ludovic Klein. So Klein is a uh, he's eighty four hundred which I imagine would put him at about eight minus 150 or something like that. Wow. He's, this is pretty, this is pretty healthy here. He's like a 186. Like, so even with the VIG, he's like minus 170 or so. That's a little bit of line value at 8,400, I think. Um now, the thing is, is that line value in and of itself on a card like this is not really going to going to do it. You know, you're going to need to have upside and, and, and finish upside and things like that. So let's take a look and see what we have here um, for Klein. Klein inside the distance uh, is actually not bad. Look at this. It's like plus one, maybe plus 130 inside the distance. You, know, you wouldn't think that if, if you kind of looked at the fighters a little bit, because Clyde did have, did have a, a boring decision or two. But, I mean, the numbers are what they are. 
Um, and, and, and also, if you look at DraftKings for a minute, DraftKings, you have Klein round one is plus 240. I mean, the odds of him winning in round one are the same as Juliana Miller pretty much. I mean, at 8,400, that's, that's really, really attractive. Um, not to mention that Ludovic Klein does have some wrestling upside as well. So this is, I think, a very, very strong play, um, kind of right off the bat, is Ludovic Klein. Uh, it's good pricing. It's got a good, ins- a pretty good inside the distance prop for that price. And you do have that wrestling to kind of fall back on. I like that a lot, actually. Um, as far as Jai Herbert goes, um, his inside the distance at, and again, we have to be very greedy here, um, like maybe plus 320. I mean, for a plus 320 inside the distance, I would want, you know, Tim to be cheaper. Those That's what I really look for by 72 and 7,300 fighters. So it looks as though Herbert is probably going to be a fade um, uh, or certainly well under. So right off the bat, well, through two fights, we're, we're on to something. I think we'll do the Klein is a very, very strong play. Okay, Joanne Wood, formerly Joanne Calderwood versus Luana Cal- uh, Carolina. You have 8,600 versus 7,600. So we're expecting to see again about a minus 170 ish. Let's take a look. And actually, Carolina is a little bit cheaper. Um, she's only, actually, that's not true. Wood is about, you know, about 160. Okay. Um, it's basically the same price as Klein Herbert. But Klein was cheaper. You see the difference there, and Klein with with the with the wrestling upside and the and the inside the distance prop. So this particular fight is probably very very poor. I mean, you look at Joanne Wood and her inside the distance prop is going to be, I mean, plus four five hundred, and that's like really awful. And and Carolina is like plus six seven hundred or something. I guess that you could say that Joanne Calderwood has uh, Wood has takedown upside maybe, but. This wouldn't be the first time people busted trying to get a takedown uh, uh, specialist against Luana Car- Carolina. I think it was Godinez, um, who everybody piled on against her, and Carolina stuffed all those takedowns. So uh, I think this fight is just basically just a stone pass. Um, and listen, when you're on a 15 fight card, uh, it's pretty important to come up with that. All right, what's not going to be a stone pass is 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 Malcolm Gordon versus Jake Hadley. So you have um, 9,300 versus 6,900. So again, we're expecting to see, you know, pretty big win odds here. And we do. He's minus 400. See, it's a similar deal to the Miller, uh, the Miller Hardy fight, but the difference is, is the inside the distance prop. So again, what we're looking for is, you know, if you're going to be 9,400, you need to have first round probably plus takedowns, you know. Um, and let's just take a look at some of these uh, some of these lines here. So Jake Hadley uh, inside the distance is a full minus one forty or so, which is really super duper strong. He does have some takedowns, but it's not the biggest part of his game. But what he might have is reversals, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, Let's look at the fight uh, on DraftKings. You have the Hadley is plus 175 to finish in the first round, which is pretty freaking good. Um, If he doesn't get out of the first, if he doesn't get it in the first round, though, the way he's going to have to do it is probably with some reversals. Now, I'm getting to this in a second. So Malcolm Gordon, he is... I mean, actually, he's quite good when it comes to his 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 jujitsu and his grappling. I mean, he um, and he's pretty aggressive. I mean, he he gave Makayev all he wanted for you know he he was in there for three rounds before he got submitted. He he actually had Makayev in a rear naked choke for a couple of seconds, and he had a takedown of his own. I mean, the guy the guy is pretty good on the ground. So in fights like this. Um, you know, if Hadley decides to engage in kind of a a, a wrestling or a grappling of, uh, battle, you can end up like with with a bunch of reversals and a bunch of takedowns, and that's one way Hadley can get there. You know, is is maybe not getting a hundred takedowns, but 
takedowns plus reversals, which add up. Um, this could be this could be a very messy. It really could be a very messy fight if it becomes a grappling uh, fight. Now, if Jake Hadley instead decides to just kind of stay at range and just try to, you know, knock him out, which Malcolm Gordon has been known to have happened to him. Then what ends up happening, it's interesting, then it becomes Hadley has to finish him in the first round or he busts, right? So it, it, it's, I think that Hadley's a good play. He's not a lock, but I think he's a good play. And the thing about Malcolm Gordon is on, on his side, I think his upside is pretty, um, it's pretty understated here by the odds because you have, not that the, the odds are wrong, but you have Gordon inside the distance, like plus like a million or whatever it is, but he's going to be going for all kinds of grappling stuff, um, or he might at least, and he's aggressive. And like I said, I mean, takedowns and, and, and reversals and this type of stuff can kind of really add up here. And he's only, he's, he's, a, he's a plus three, what, 320 to win, something like that. So he's going to win about 25% of the time or so, maybe a little less, 20% of the time. But as opposed to 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 Machado at the bottom of the card here, um, if you play Gordon, you're getting the extra benefit of probably getting some leverage over a, a high-owned fighter. You know, you have Hadley with a really strong inside the distance prop coming off but also a, a submission win of his own. Um I feel as though that if, in fact, Gordon does get it done, it's, number one, going to score really, really well. And number two, it's going to get a decent amount of leverage over uh, Headley. So I think that Gordon is actually a very, very strong, 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 speculative underdog play. So I do like both sides of this fight um, quite a bit, actually. Uh, moving on, uh, Duncan, there are a couple of Duncans on this fight, this card, so make sure you get this right. This would be Christian Duncan against uh, Dusko Todorovic. And we have, let's look at the odds. I mean, the, the, the price. Um, one second. We have Duncan 8,700, Todorovic 7,500. So we're probably looking at, I don't know, two, minus 200, something like that. Maybe a little bit less for Duncan. Let's take a look. Duncan's, uh, it's a full plus two, minus 215 with the VIG about minus 190. So, I mean, I guess there's a little bit of, of line value in him, um, but not that much. Because I mean, remember, the $9,200 guys, these are like minus 400s. So I don't know what you want to make Duncan to decrease the line value. I think it's pretty fair. Um, let's take a look at the inside the distance props, though. So you have Duncan at 8,800. What you're going to need is probably pretty as close to even money inside the distance. Probably like plus 130 should probably be good enough. And if you look at it, you have Duncan with a very, very strong inside the distance prop. He's minus 138. So even with the big, it's probably minus 110. And then when you look at it on DraftKings here, Christian Duncan round one is just as likely as Jake Hadley round one. So this is an extremely strong play uh, for, for, for Christian Duncan. Um, on the other hand, you have Sidorovich, who his path to victory is probably wrestling based. Um, and when you have a guy that's, that's whose path to victory is wrestling based, you have to respect it. Um, even though, look, his inside the distance prop really doesn't exist here. Um, let's see, Todorovic inside the distance. Uh, I don't even have him listed here yet, but it's trust me, it's poor. But if he, in fact, does win, again, you know, will he win? Probably not. But, you know, if it's two to one underdog, he probably wins about 20, you know, about 30% of the time or so, 28%. So if that percent of the time he wins, is that going to be good enough? Well, I do believe that his inside the distance, excuse me, that his win condition is predicated on wrestling and grappling and things like that. So if in fact he does win, I think that he is going to score probably not always, but probably well enough to at least be in, 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 in uh, consideration for the optimal. And then we go back to the other thing I said before, with respect to the previous fight, 
is that I think because of the metrics on Chris Duncan, uh, excuse me, on Christian Duncan, he's probably going to get some ownership. So if that's the case, you're getting not only a decent win condition for Todorovic, um, uh, not only a, a score that's going to be predicated on that win condition, I should say, but you're also going to get some leverage. So I think that both sides of this fight are very much in play. All right, moving uh, along and I guess up the card, you have uh, not <laughs> let's see George Santos. It's not true. Gabriel Santos against Lerone Murphy. You have two totally different uh, different situations here. You have Murphy, who's basically been off 16 months, who actually has had fight canceled. Um, and then you have Santos, who's been sort of active, but he's taken the fight under one on one week's notice. Okay. So you have Murphy at 8,300, um, 7,900. So I imagine Murphy should be about a minus 130, minus 140. But if I'm pretty, if I'm not mistaken, there's probably some line value here. Um, let's see. Well, not really. Like Murphy is, it's minus 180, but with the VIG, minus, probably minus 150. It's very similar to, to Radovic line. So yeah, I guess he's a, a little, he's kind of probably a better line value play than Ladovic Klein. But let's take a look at the inside the distance prop here. So you have Murphy inside the distance is really, really poor. I mean, it's plus 300. And, and you have that along with, with no takedown upside. Uh, this seems like a, a pretty poor play, if you want to know the truth, based on the metrics. I mean, we'll take a look here and see if this looks any better. Murphy round run plus 500. So 20% of the time he gets there. Um, well, not 20% here, remember, it's plus 500. That means actuality probably gets a first round KO 15% of the time. So 15% of the time he gets there. And does he make the optimal when he gets there? Okay, that's fair enough. So 15% of the time he's optimal. I think he's going to be owned more than that because of his price. And because, you know, he's, he's got a good record and he's and it's in England and all that stuff. And people perceive that he's got the decision, uh, you know, decision advantage because it's in England. And while that very well may, may be true, um, that we don't care about what happens if he gets a decision. If he wins a decision, he's not making optimal. He does not never in a million years. So um, I think he's probably sort of a fade. I think I think that at the very least, he's a worse play than Klein. Um, and the thing about Santos is, again, because of his inside the distance prop is very similar to Murphy's, given the, you know, the price. So unless Santos has some big takedown upside that I'm not aware of, um, I mean, this is not really such a great play either. So I think this is this this could be a very strategic fade here because I do I do think that that because of the fight because of the, the price and just because of what I've heard I think people are going to play this fight a little bit and I don't know the metrics are not really supporting it so we will we'll probably end up having being much higher on say Klein and say the Duncan Sudorovich fight than than this Santos Murphy fight. All right, so Makaya versus uh, Fijo. This is the you know the throw the uh, throw the throw David to the Lions. Uh, what you call it? Uh, throw the Roman to the Lions. Throw the Christians to the Lions. Uh, fight. Um, you have Makaya, who's like a million to one, and he's being priced like it. Uh, he is was he ninety seven hundred? Let's see. Yeah, he's ninety seven hundred. So this is the. This is the Mario Batista of the week. You know, the big, it's a, it's the, it's literally the exact same play. Um, it's not the same slate though, but it's the same play. He's 9,700. He's probably going to get a Mather in the first round and he's probably going to get a takedown or two to do it. Okay. Um, I just, it's literally the same. Um, the only difference is, is that it's a 15 fight card instead of a 12. So if you feed him, you have a better chance of, of, of making up those points than if you faded Batista to make up those. As it turns out, I don't even think Batista made the winning lineup. Um, actually, I think he did, actually. Um, but uh, that's the only thing, is that if he can ends up like super-duper high-owned, um, I bet you there are other ways to get there. But the cool thing about it is that if you play pairings with, say, Makayev and, and say... 
um, to Rovich or, or Mal- God forbid, Malcolm Gordon gets there. I mean, then then you're gonna then you're, then you're gonna want this. Okay, um, let's just take a look at some of the metrics here, just to make sure that we're not we're not hallucinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, Makayev inside the distance is minus one twenty. My submission alone is plus one ten. I mean, it's 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 the same play. He's probably probably a very strong play, and if you can get to him, great. Um, Feel ho, uh, you know, it's plus two million. I'm not gonna play. All right. Um Ashmos versus uh Sam Patterson. Okay, so this is 9k versus 7200. So we're expecting to see again a big minus 300 favorite or something like that. Um take a look at it. Yeah, I mean it's fair enough, minus 280 or something like that. Now, again, at 9K, what you need – see, at 9K, you don't need everything. Like, you, you need either big grappling upside or, uh, like, an inside-the-distance prop at about pick em. And I think you're getting it just from the inside-the-distance prop on Patterson. Let's just take a look. Uh, Patterson inside the distance, yeah, he's at minus 110. So that's very, very reasonable. Um, let's take a look at the um, – on DraftKings, like round one stuff, I presume it'll be, well, this is actually pretty interesting. Like him round one is not very good. Him round one is plus 250. I mean, think about this. Him round one is the same as Juliana Miller. Him round one is the same as Ludovic Klein. That's pretty amazing, right? For a 9K fighter. Um, So, I mean, if you really are a stickler, and you're looking at the at the odds here. Patterson is probably kind of a fade, you know, because in the absence of big takedown upside, which which I don't think exists for him, he's gonna need. I mean, probably either a first round knockout or just a really high volume second round knockout. And it doesn't look like that's in the cards here. I mean, because what's going to happen is his opponent's going to be shooting for takedowns and trying to make this kind of ugly. And Sam Patterson in this two-round decision, the two-round finish does not look great at 9K. Um, so the plus 250 number is is probably getting me off of him. Uh, or at the very least, I might get – this is this this could be interesting because he might end up being popular because it's pure inside the distance prop. But when you when you drill it down to the round one prop, which is really what's what's most important for you know fifteen fight cards and nine k fighters with no real wrestling upside, I'm probably going to end up under on him, which is not what I expected. Um, okay, with respect to Amros again, he's just plus. Okay, so wait a minute. So Amros is plus two twenty, and no inside the distance prop, but he probably has some wrestling upside. Is it worth taking a shot at him for the, like I said, 20% of the time that he wins, 25% of the time he wins? Oh, I, 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 it's hard. I'll probably end up having to sprinkle him. This is one of those where if, in fact, Patterson becomes high-owned, um, and high meaning maybe 26 27% plus, then I'll maybe take a shot at some, uh, some of the Israeli. Just again, just to get some leverage because is I think his win condition is is strong. You know, um, it's gonna be a tough decision to get because you know the the, the judges have not been favoring uh, grapplers in general, and the judges are probably not gonna be favoring uh, fighters that are against the British fighters. So it's uh, it's gonna be a tough one for him to get. But if he does get it, boy, I don't know, maybe. So I'll probably sprinkle him, but but definitely not a priority. Okay, uh, moving on. We have Omar Morales versus Chris Duncan. Eighty, yeah, we have. To, now this is this is not Christian Duncan. This is Chris Duncan. This guy's the problem. So what this guy is is from Britain. So we got got to be careful about this. Anyway, you have eighty two hundred versus eight K. So I presume it's pretty close to a pick. Em. Let's just take a look at it. Yep, it's pretty close. Um, so we'll take a look at the inside the distance prop. The inside of distance prop for an AK fight probably needs to be like plus 200 or so. 
We'll take a look. Omar Morales inside the distance is right about that, about plus 200. Duncan inside the distance is pretty reasonable, though, at plus 160. I mean, Duncan is probably going to be the preferred option here. Um, let's take a look at the DraftKings where they have this. Duncan round one plus 300. I mean, at, at, at 8,200. And it's not as good as, say, Klein, but it's pretty good. Um, I mean, he's bet almost the same as Patterson at 800 less, as an example. Um, and Omar Morales, plus 350. It's a little worse, but not. it's not that much worse. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you should probably play both these dudes. Um, you know, the, the pricing lets you get up to some of the higher price fighters. And they're inside the distance prop, and their their round one prop is pretty reasonable. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect to see any kind of takedowns in this fight. I think it's going to be a striking based fight where someone's going to get the KO. Hopefully, if if not, then the fight busts. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, so moving on, we have uh, uh, Mahmoud. Is it Mahmoud? Makir. Makwan Amirakani versus Jack Shore. Um, you have 9,500 versus 6,700, another huge price gap, which means you're probably going to see like minus 500 or something like that. And that's what we get, minus, about minus 460 or something like that. So we'll first look at the Jack Shore side. And, and for Jack Shore to, you know, remember to pay off 9,500, he's got to uh, probably both have first round, significant first round upside. Well, you have to have significant inside the distance upside, plus probably take them out. Um, if not, you better knock him out in the first round. So let's just take a look and see what the metrics show here. So, well, forget the, forget the regular inside the distance prop. Let's just go straight to first round here. So Jack Shore first round at plus 200. Right? That, that, that's pretty reasonable, right? Uh, so it's not quite as good as Mikhaev. Basically, it's not as good as Duncan, though. Wow, yeah, this is – maybe this isn't so great. So if he doesn't get him out of there in the first round, you're going to need him to get, like, takedowns. And I, I feel as though that the Marikani is kind of more the guy that's going to get the takedowns here, if anything. Um, oh, goodness gracious. So, So you're saying that – Jack Shore gets him out of there in the first round 30% of the time. Is that the case? And he's probably going to be 30% owned. And all the times he doesn't get him, and all the times he knocks him out in the first round doesn't necessarily win anyway. You know, because because the way this fight's probably going to go is, is Americani is going to be going for takedowns, going for submission. Jack Shore is going to fight him off and then either knock him out in the first round or probably get, you know, get him later. But but I, I don't think in either of those cases, Shore scores particularly well. So um, probably going to be under, I guess. Um, now, the Marikani, but well, we're going to get to his round one prop in a minute when we can talk about betting. But we'll actually, when we do the separate betting break, then this is, this is kind of obscene. I mean, because this is basically like one of these two things is, is Marikani's total win condition here. Um, so with that said, you kind of have to play him. I mean, at 6,800. I mean, this is a, a case where he he's going to win the fight about, what, 15% of the time? But he's plus, plus 400, so that's 25, 20, maybe 15% of the time. But I think every single time that he wins, he's on. Him. So is he going to be more than 15, 15% on, though? Um, okay, maybe, maybe it'll be a break-even play. But I think for upside... I, I, you have to play some of these. And, and you realize that 85% of those lineups are dead because you're there is going to lose like 85% of the time. But in the 15% of the time that he wins, you're going to be a freaking hero, you know? And, and then, then you get to play all your, your, you know, your Jake Hadley's and your, and your, um, whatchamacallits and your, uh, well, we'll get to the main event in a minute and we'll get to, uh, and your Makayev's. Um, and, but 85% of those lineups are going to lose. <laughs> it just is. They just are. All right. Uh, moving on. Casey O'Neill. Is it the next one? Casey O'Neill? No, no, not yet. 
So the lead say versus Marvin Vittori. So Vittori is 9,100 to 7,100. So you're expecting, you know, you're probably going to get a plus, minus 400, something like that. Maybe minus 300. Take a look at it. It's actually kind of thin here. I mean, it's plus 275. So the line value kind of stinks. Um, I, I think Vittori should probably be, I guess this is fair. I should be about 9K, maybe something like that. But the thing is about Vitt Vittori is that regardless, if you're 9,100, you're going to need like you know, inside the distance prop at, at, at minus 110 or a bunch of takedowns. And, and, and this is, he doesn't have this. You know, Vittori inside the distance is hopeless. His only real chance here to get there is to get a bunch of takedowns. Now, he has done that. Okay, if you look at his, this is this one particular fight I want to highlight here. He, you know, he he got a million takedowns against Kevin Holland and route to. I think I won the optimal in this one actually, um, in and route to a million point score, and he did have four takedowns against Israel Adesanya in, in a loss. So he could he could do this, um, and that would be his path to victory. Um, and I guess yeah, listen, Carl Williams did that at ninety one hundred last week, but I just don't. I think Vittori is just not going to be I, – I don't want to make this value judgment here. It's just kind of hard to know, like, like whether he's going to be going for all these takedowns or not. Like, his last fight against Whitaker, he had zero takedowns. Now, again, Whitaker is great at takedown defense. But here at Sanchez, I mean, he, he basically struck with him the whole time. I mean, he doesn't go for takedowns all the time here. So uh, I think his, Vittori is probably a weak play. That's just my, my, my gut here. Roman's elite say, what can you say? I mean, the guy just submits everybody. Hold on one second. Sorry, and what can you say about the guy? The guy gets there as the underdog every freaking fight. I mean, he, he he's 7,500, no problem. First round KO. 7,800, no problem. First round KO. Uh, Hermanson, they don't even put a salary up here, but no problem. Second round KO. And then he had a win before that. I mean, what's, what's the guy going to do? What's the guy got to do to get a little respect? Um, I mean, he's a plus 180, but I mean, he just he just wins every fight by KO. I, 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 well, look at the numbers here, but why why would you not play this guy? I don't know. So let's see. Delete say uh, inside the distance. I mean, what is he? Plus 300? I okay, that's reasonable. But his price? Just for fun, let me see what Delete Say Round One is. Um, Delete Say Round One is uh, probably a million to one. Let's just take a look. Uh, plus 650. So 10% of the time or so gets there round one. Yeah, the problem here is that that Vittori just doesn't get finished. That's that's the, that's the only issue here. I'm probably just going to end up fading it, but if he gets, a, if the lead say gets another first or second round KO as the underdog, I mean, I'm just going to feel like an idiot for not having it. So I'm, I'm probably going to play a little, but not, but not in, in, not in anything big. Um, okay. Um, moving on. Uh, Casey O'Neill versus Jennifer Maya. So this one's a rough one. You have Jennifer Maya is a veteran and, and Casey O'Neill was, was a big, big hype train who had, who's now off a couple of years. She's an 8,500 favorite. Uh, so we're expecting uh, minus 160, minus 170. Let's take a look at it. So line value is fine, but let's take a look at the inside the distance props here. O'Neill inside the distance is pretty poor, you know. Um, my inside the distance doesn't exist, but the O'Neill thing is really, really tricky because while her inside the distance prop is poor, her actual DraftKings scoring is through the freaking roof because of two things that are kind of hard to quantify in advance. Again, that would be takedowns and that would be volume. Okay. So if you look at her, her results here, you know, she has, first of all, three of her last four were by finish. Okay. But not only that, I mean, in her last decision, she had 229 significant strikes for real. Piling up 122 points with no takedowns. 
That's like almost unheard of. And then you have other fights where she had four takedowns against Dobson plus the, the KO. I mean, she just scores points, you know? So this is one where I just have this feeling that when people just run optimals, they're probably not going to get to her that much because, I mean, her inside the distance prop is not great. But it's just kind of hard to to dispute like these other metrics, which I guess is going to go into the projection. So maybe she will be played here, but um, you just have to play some of her. I, mean, I almost listen. It's it's two years two year layoff, and it's women's MMA, and it's very possible that you know Maya just kind of you know is just a little bit too has too much experience for her. But if if, if O'Neill is kind of ready to go and just just puts it on my, I mean, this is going to score through the freaking roof, you know? So um, you're going to have to play her. And, and Maya, uh, again, if, if I thought O'Neal was going to be like super duper popular, maybe you could play Maya, but you just can't. I mean, the inside the distance prop is not good. Um, uh, and at 7,700, you, you're just never going to get there in, in a low volume decision, which is the way Maya would probably do it. Now I've heard people speculate that Maya, she has a path to victory in, in wrestling, which she's never tried. I mean, I, I can't play a fighter to do that. Okay, so we just have three fights left. We have uh, Brian Barberina against Gunnar Nelson, uh, and you have 9,200 against 7K. So you're expecting, again, to have like a minus 400 out of Nelson, and that's pretty much what you're getting. You're also uh, probably going to get a poor inside the distance prop. We're going to get to Y in a minute. Nelson inside the distance is... It's actually... Pretty freaking reasonable. What is this? Minus 110? I was not expecting that. Um, but I guess they're they're, they're saying that he's going to get that submission after all. I mean, let's look at let's look at him up here just for the hell of it. Gunnar Nelson, round one, plus 225. That's extremely strong. I I wasn't expecting this. Because listen, in Gunnar Nelson's last fight, it was more boredom city you know he just took down santa sato and did nothing except basically just control him for three rounds and barbarina is kind of he's scrappy uh, but maybe the scrappiness is gonna what's gonna get to him here but well this round one inside the distance prop, this one round one prop is much better than i thought it was going to be given the fact that he's got those takedowns you know what i mean like he's gonna both he's gonna take down upside he's got control time upside He's going to have finish upside. So this is a – I'm only hoping that recency bias kind of precludes him from being that high owned because if you if people watch his last fight, you're not going to want to play him, okay? He's not very aggressive, and he's always been like this. He just kind of just does what it takes to get the job done here. Um, so if that's the case and he's sort of low owned – can't imagine him being low on with this inside the distance prop though. Um, so I, I you're gonna have to play him with these numbers. Um Barbarina, uh sure. Uh if he can somehow avoid the takedowns, he's a much better striker. Uh what's his win on? I mean, if he's like what's his win on? It's plus three to one. Is he gonna win? So if he wins, say what twenty percent of the time, does he does he knock the guy out? Is that going to be enough? And probably not. Listen, I'm a sucker for it, so I'll probably play a little of them. But 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 as far as like a priority underdog, definitely not him. All right. So uh, last two we have. This is this is fun. So Raphael Fizia versus Justin Gaethje. Every time Gaethje's in a fight, there's just it's just kind of you know it's just fireworks. So I'm expecting there to be a lot of action here. But let's just kind of analyze. You have Fiziev, 8,800, Gaethje, 7,400. So expecting, again, you know, nice, like 200, 180, something like that. Getting – Fiziev is uh, getting some steam here on him. Um, so I guess there's a little bit of line value on him. But, again, let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. You have Fiziev inside the distance is – He's a he's pretty strong there at, at very close to pick him. I didn't expect it to be that strong. I expected him 
his wing condition to be more of kind of like keeping him arranged that, you know, piecing him up, but you're getting a pretty decent, you know, inside the distance prop for his price here. So this is actually pretty strong. Um, let's look at the first round uh, upside as well of him. Um, you have, he's plus 300. Still find it very interesting. How <laughs> little bit Klein's inside the distance prop is so, so, so short. Um, but Fizia plus 300, it's, it's a little worse than Gunnar Nelson though. So yeah, I, I, well, he's also a little bit cheaper. So I guess I'd have to say that he's very similar as far as just, he's not a similar play because they're going to get there in different ways. But I think given the metric, I think that, that he's very similar to Gunnar Nelson as, as a kind of a good spend up. And Justin Gaethje, um, so his round one, one prop is plus 650. So at least 10% of the time, he's going to smash. Um, I would also say, by the way, that Gaethje in round two is going to be good enough also. Like if he gets there in round two, it's going to be because there's a whole bunch of volume and all kinds of stuff. So I think between the two of those, he probably gets like a, a finish inside the first two rounds about at least 15% of the time. Um, let's look at his inside the distance prop, actually. Gaethje inside the distance is at plus three, 320, which is totally reasonable for his price. So listen, uh, this is kind of, I think it's probably going to end up being sort of a popular underdog. So you have to kind of worry about that a little bit, but, but Gage, he's always all action. And if he does win, he is going to score really, really well for 7,400. So I, I'm going to be with the field on this. I, I think he's definitely one of the big underdogs you have to kind of consider. And again, the way, the way leverage works, right? I don't think that Gage, that, that Fiziev is going to be necessarily that chalky. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, uh, first of all, you could play Fiziev getting some leverage over what I think is going to be a sort of popular Gaethje underdog thing. Um, so I think that both these guys are probably in play here. And then we have uh, the main event. You have Usman versus Edwards. Um, and I imagine we're going to have to play this fight. Um, you have Edwards, who is a 8,900, 7,300. So I'm expecting about a minus 200 favorite. It's a little bit better than that. So he's got a little bit of line value. And the other thing about this is that Usman has just kind of a great combination of everything here. He's got an inside the distance prop, which is, I imagine, is close to pick him. Let me just look at it. Usman inside the distance. Actually, that's not true. His inside the distance prop is actually really poor. Wow, I didn't know that. It's like plus 260. But the thing is, is that what he does have is, is takedown upside a lot of it and he's got five rounds of volume to work with i mean to give you an example we'll look at the last fight this is kind of intriguing when these guys fought last uzman scored 98 fantasy points and lost because he got ko'd right but you think about it if he survived that last like one minute he gets 128 fantasy points and this discussion doesn't exist, you know? So if you consider that that one shot as being a lucky punch, then Usman is just kind of a lock, you know? Um, I mean, how does he not score 100 in wins? Um, he scores 100 in losses. Let's look at some of these scores here. Has he ever scored under 100? I mean, no. I mean, this one, back in 2018, the five-round decision, you know what I mean? That was the only time he didn't score 100. So, I mean, I presume he's going to be the most popular fighter on the slate, but it's kind of a tough fade, right? He's got everything going for him. He's got he's got equity in a loss. He's got equity in a way. You know what I mean? Like, this is uh, this is pretty strong. And on the other hand, Edwards, I mean, he's 7,300. I mean, uh, 7,300. I presume he's got, what, he's got a, probably a plus 500 KO prop again. We'll take a look at it. Um Inside the distance for Edwards is uh, well, even better than that. Like, well, maybe about plus 500, something like that. So about 15% of the time, he gets the KO. You know, the only problem is him in a decision. I don't even know what that looks like. Um, I guess he could get a takedown of his own. Possible. 
I'll probably end up being under on Edwards here. I just I just don't feel as though the metric support, like aside from him getting the the, the KO, which he'll get 15% of the time probably, or the submission of some kind 15% of the time, in which case you're gonna want him. I think when he gets the decision, like I don't I don't think it's particularly good. You know, I think it's listen, how does he even get a decision? I, I don't I don't even see how that's possible. So um I'd probably be under on Edwards, probably be over on on the on uh Usman. So listen, 15 fight card, lots, lots of stuff going on. Lots to prioritize. Uh uh, I guess overall, I would say that according to the metrics. Ludovic Klein looks like the best play on the board. He just does. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, and then there are underdogs you could play. Um, you could play. Um, well, you could you could key that 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 um, that uh, Gordon Hadley fight. Play that underdog. You could play both sides of the Todorovic Duncan fight. I would probably fade the Santos fight for the most part. Makaya, he's got to get in there. Patterson, I'm probably a little under on this fight, actually. Duncan Morales, probably played both these guys. Uh, sure, Americani. Americani, very, very live. DraftKings underdog that's going to lose 85% of the time. Uh, Delice, probably have to play a little of him, just in case. Yeah. Uh, probably going to be, at the end of the day, off of Barbarina. And Maya. Gaethje, definitely play some of that. So it's... Uh, it's a lot of good plays you can make. Uh, it's a pretty good 150 max line uh, uh, build uh, this week, just because there's a lot of combinations you want. And uh, I guess that'll do it. Watch for my betting breakdown, which is going to approach us in a completely different way. And watch for my sheets for uh, ownership projections uh, as we get closer to the fight day. Uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.